Let's please welcome Dr. Proto. I'm honored to be here and uh, to speak to you. And there are some uh, seats down at the front, so you can go to sleep on, rather than standing up. It's, it's, uh, um, anyway, I'm glad to see so many young people here, and hopefully I have something interesting to tell you. Um, but can I have the lights down a bit so we can see this is too much light on this? Is someone organizing that? Is that better to see now? Yes, okay. All right. Um, this is a, a moderately serious lecture, and uh, I start with my favorite quotation, that if you make people think they're thinking, they love you. But if you really make them think, they hate you. Okay. <laughs> so that's, you know what you're going to get. And I want to also say that I'm basically not here to make you comfortable. I'm here to make you think. And thinking can be a dangerous thing. I'm going to start with science, because it's very misunderstood. And also, really, it had another name. And I want to talk about the birth of natural philosophy. Pierre Abelard in the 12th century, he was very important in this. And in a book, Sic et Non, in Latin, yes or no, writes, by doubting, we come to inquire. And by inquiry, we arrive at truth. Okay, And then, a little later in the 16th century, Francis Bacon, a philosopher, he said in his books um, called Novum Organum, and it's interesting to translate that, because in Latin that means new instrument. He outlined what science is, and in the 16th century, science was a new instrument, totally novel. Okay, there was no really no science before that, and I'll argue that point. Basically, observation, hypothesis, evidence, and then a law of nature. I want you to think about those things. I'm not going to discuss Spinoza. Spinoza is a very interesting philosopher. You should learn something about him, and David Hume as well. These were interesting philosophers about what is true and what can be accepted. The birth of science. I think really goes back to Tycho Brahe. And look at these beautiful instruments. What he was doing was studying the motion of Mars and the planets. Okay? He made these experiments with really incredibly beautiful equipment. Just look at the precision of this. Absolutely stunning. Very, very difficult experiments indeed. And then Kepler, and I'm using stamps and banknotes because you'll notice that here scientists are on stamps and banknotes, okay? And here we see Kepler, and he wrote a book on the basis of those measurements of Tycho Brahe, the Rudolphine tables, and he had to, he had no calculator, he had no computer, he had to come work out his own log tables, and he re realized from these, that the sun was not at the center of a circle, but was actually at the focus of an ellipse. And that was an incredibly important observation. That was the first experiment that led to science. Okay? I'm not going to discuss some famous scientists, Christian Huygens, Newton, Leibniz, but I'm going to tell you about a person you've never heard of, Willem Sagravasander. And he proved that Newton's laws were correct. He took brass balls at varying velocities and showed that a ball which went twice as fast as another made an impression four times as deep as the first one, okay? And here is the experiment that he carried out. And in, these, in this book, he actually says that Mr. Leibniz was the first to suggest that the force of a moving body is not proportional to the velocity according to the general understanding, but is due but to the square. So if one doubles the velocity, then the force is quadrupled. We therefore have the start of a half mv squared for the, for the kinetic energy. It was not known. These were, was a struggle by Kepler, by Tycho Brahe, by Newton and Leibniz to create our understanding of energy. So he is one of my heroes. And in fact, you can think of this man as having done by himself what 2,000 scientists have done with the Higgs boson. All right? Think of it in those terms. Emily de Chatelet was an important woman scientist, and she translated 
Newton's Principia into French. And in fact, Voltaire, one of, one of her lovers, who wrote to Frederick II of Prussia to say that Du Châtelet was a great man whose only fault was that she was a woman. Okay. And here is a book written by a friend of mine, David Budanis, on this passionate mind. People who created the Enlightenment. Okay. Language is the key to culture. If I want to understand Croatian... Uh, sorry, Croatian. Uh, uh, your culture, okay, here in Korea. I've got to learn Korean language. And I've got to be able to write it. If, and so you must recognize the language is important to culture. Without it, you don't understand it. Okay. Okay. So there you have it. And if we look at Hooke's Law, what did Hooke actually do? Well, he gave a lecture like this one. And he said the power of a spring is in the same proportion with the tension thereof. That is, if one power stretch or bend it one space, then two will bend it two, and three will bend it three, and so forward. That is Hooke's Law. There is no equation here. There is no equation in Hooke's law. But this equation is an equation. It has an equal sign. And in fact, the equal sign was invented in 1550. Van Fleck, in a famous paper, started to think about things like this. Two times three is equal to six, but three times two is not is equal to six. But in the quantum world, sometimes A times B is not equal to B times A. And that fascinated me when I was a young person, because it turns out you have to understand these things to understand basically sight and light, or what's going on in space. And Van Fleck wrote this, he said, practically everyone knows that the components of total angular momentum of a molecule relative to x, y, z fixed in space satisfy these commutation relationships. So when I arrived in Korea at the airport, I asked everybody I could see whether they actually knew this. But actually, nobody did. Okay. But if you want to be a scientist, you want to understand life, you want to understand the world you live in, you, all you need to know is to start to understand this equation in which Jx times Jy is not equal to Jy times Jx. And I found that fascinating. So kinetic energy was not known to Newton. It was Leibniz who corrected this. Okay, it's all about synthesis. Well, what do I mean? Well, we take the arts, the sciences, the music, writing, human, graphics. You do not know where your creative urge will come to bring them together. I'm going to talk about that. Creativity by synthesis in one of my favorite graphic designs. So what do I mean by that? Well, here is a field. Well, it actually has various things growing in it. We take carbon dioxide and water and add photons, and we get a carbohydrate. And then we take that carbohydrate with an enzyme, zymase, and we create alcohol. And here is my favorite laboratory. Okay, all right. And here is my favorite uh, product. And here is a little animal who would like to drink it. And here I am, enjoying <laughs> the fruits of synthesis. All right. So what do I mean? I mean to take things and bring them together and create something new and valuable. That's what creativity is about. You look around, see what other people have done, and bring them together in a new fashion. I'll talk a bit about the discovery of C60. Pasteur said, in the fields of observation, chance favors only the prepared mind. Well, what does he mean? He means education. So I'm going to tell you that, believe it or not, I was young, like many of you, OK? I know it's hard to believe. And when I was a little boy, at seven years old, my name was Kotashina, and the teacher wrote to say, Miss Barker thinks I'd better write and tell you that we are not at all pleased with the way Harold, that's me, has been working during the last few weeks. He's very fond of play. <laughs> all right. Well, when I was a kid, I didn't want to be a scientist. I never know that I ever wanted to be a scientist. I didn't know what I wanted to be. I just traveled along the way. When I was a child, a little boy, I wanted to be Superman. <laughs> and I thought you'd want some proof, and here it is. <laughs> All right? Oh, sorry, there's not much, I was rowing, not much water. I did gymnastics, 
here and I played tennis. And I also acted in the play, Henry V at school. And here, I'll blow these two up. I'm the handsome guy on the right, in case you don't know. Okay? But I always tell young people like you, do not become an actor. Whatever you do, don't become an actor. Because the guy in front, he became an actor, and he is 5,000 years old. And I'm a lot younger than you. Ian and I were in the same year at school, we're friends to this day, okay. And he was Magneto, a fantastic actor, and as you know, in The Lord of the Rings. And he came out to visit us in Tallahassee, and here is a picture of him. However, I really want to discuss some other aspects as well. So I decided I'm going to do things only for the fun of it. And only that afternoon when I was eating lunch, some kid threw up a plate in the cafeteria which has a blue medallion on the plate, the Cornell sign in the cafeteria. And then he threw up the plate and it came down. It wobbled and the blue thing went around like this. And I wondered, it seemed like the blue thing went around faster than the wobble. And I wondered what the relation was between the two. So I was just playing, no importance at all. So I played around with the equations of motion of the rotating things. And I found out that if the wobble is small, the blue thing goes around twice as fast as the wobble comes around. And then I tried to figure out if I could see why that was directly from Newton's laws instead of through the complicated equations. And I worked that out for the fun of it. This rotation led me to the problem, a similar problem of the rotation of the spin of an electron according to Dirac's equation. And that just led me back into quantum electrodynamics, which is the problem I've been working on. And I kept, I kept continuing now to play with it in the relaxed fashion I had originally done and everything, this is like getting a cork out of a bottle, everything just poured out. Uh, by the way, in very short order, work the things out for which I later won the Nobel Prize. Now I showed you that because he was playing as a scientist. And I think that's very important. He wasn't aiming at Nobel Prizes. He was just fascinated by this thing. It was no important, it wasn't important. And I wanted to think very carefully about that. Because I want to tell you, I didn't go into science to win any prizes at all, let alone the Nobel Prize. I didn't know what the Nobel Prize when I was, was when I was your age. I needed a job. I had to, get to and make some money. <laughs> well, what did I do also? Well, I had McConnell. I made things out of McConnell. And I thought I'd show you this adversity. McConnell boys, of course, today, as we got to have girls, are keen, ambitious, and inventive. No boy or girl. <laughs> who follows the McConnell how they can be a bad boy or bad girl. And so, as a child, you're in the most creative time, making things with your hands. And these nuts and bolts, I made things with nuts and bolts, and putting a screw together was, for me, a really, I enjoyed doing this. And that's what I enjoy doing as a chemist. I sort of like to put atoms together, with electrons holding them together, in the same way. I had a camera, and this is my camera. All right. And let me tell you what it was like to take a photograph. All right, now let's just watch it. That is what you had to do to take a photograph. All right. You had to adjust every, all these things, take the film out, develop it, okay? Wash it, okay? Take it, hang, hang it out to dry. And then you had to take the negatives and, and produce the print. You had to do that, all that to get a picture. And you had to get a very good in incentive, you had a good reason. And basically, she's here in the audience now. Now then, today, all you need to do is basically that. And you don't know what's, most of you don't know what's going on inside. I knew everything about the camera, everything about my world. And your world is very different. And I think there are some issues there. I also, my main interest always has been not science, but art and graphics. And these are brochures that were free. I used to go down and collect these pre brochures. And I had to buy that one. All, these are all things that I collected. Because my interest is in visual graphic art, my favorite image of the sun. Is there any more beautiful image of the sun than that one? Menus, covers and that, post, free postcards, okay. 
things I really enjoyed. And in fact, I used to collect cartoons. Then we'll win the Nobel Prize and get rich and go on talk shows. What about babes? When do we get those? Okay, all right. And so I captured these photographs. It was any image that I found interesting. And this is perhaps the first book that I collected myself. And most of that ends up in the trash can. What a waste. It's beautiful art. That's why I, I can't bear to throw those things away. Now, when I was at school, I used to do drawings. Okay, these are some of my drawings at school. Okay. And then at university, I did posters uh, and brochures. And this was a poster on the underground. And uh, these are the cover of the magazine. When I was at university, I was the art editor, and I used to do the covers of the university magazine. This design got into an annual of, gra of graphic art, a, a professional annual of graphic art, a menu, uh, my own book. And my first award was not for science, it was for this design. And here it is, and I used to look like this. Believe it or not, you know, you're, you're all young and beautiful, but you're gonna look old and decrepit it like me one day. So enjoy your youth and beauty whilst you may. Some of us know it does not last, okay. Anyway, these are some of the drawings that I did and uh, still to this day, Margaret out here in the front, a uh, whole load of these and I only got good from my frog. I was irritated. I thought it should be very good for my frog. Right, that's so those are the sort of things. I had an interest in architecture as well. I used to draw buildings, and this is Stockholm Town Hall, where the Nobel Prize is awarded. This is part of Sussex University that intrigued me at the art world. One of my favorite buildings, the Gaudi Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. And one of my, I think my all-time favorite building is this. It's the Marin County Civic Center, just north of San Francisco. And here is a case of synthesis. Where does this come from? Well, it comes from the Roman aqueducts. This, these aqueducts are 2,000 years old. And here we see the same design used by Frank Lloyd Wright in this beautiful building. And so, your education shouldn't just be science. It should be all those things, and look at them and get interested. I also learned to play the guitar, and Margaret is here in the middle, when I was at university. Then I did Flash of as, as a researcher, and this was developed by George Porter. And I thought, I'll show you what it is, okay? Basically, it's a quartz cell and a spectrograph, a trigger, a capacitor, a flash lamp, a photocell, a delay unit, a flash capacitor, and this. And what did you do? You fill the quartz cell with gas, bromophore, charge the capacitors, okay? Trigger the spark gap, you fire the lamp, that produces a free radical, the photocell, through a delay unit, fires another lamp and passes the light onto the spectrograph. And that's how we used to observe the spectra of free radicals, okay? So that was my first research program. But then I went on to make molecules, and we made a lot of molecules. All these were new at the time. Carbon sulfur double bonded species, carbon phosphorus double bonded. No one had made a carbon phosphorus double bond. And only one carbon phosphorus triple bond had been made. So but, but as I became a researcher, I found I could do things. I was very surprised. I didn't go to do, become a professor. I just needed a job. And I found that, well, somehow I could do things which were interesting. Anyway, those last two molecules at the bottom were really turned out to be really quite interesting. And so now I'll go on to, to this one. And just before I do, just pull this down, which is here. All right. I'm going to show you my favorite molecule. It's nitrosoethane because it's like this. Does it look like anything? Yeah, it's my dog. Carbon hydrogen, blue head, red nose. Okay. I look at the spectrum, the dog shakes its head right. and looks at its tail. Okay. Not only that, my dog is going to do interesting things, okay. and what's more, it's been drinking. That's why it's got a red nose, okay? And if you've been drinking, you know what the problem is. Oh, oh yes, is it too much? Oh, you really need a lamppost, and you can do it, okay. Now, I want to show you this because I want you to learn something from this, that molecules are flexible, all right? And I think 
they're not rigid structures. And that flexibility is very, very important. And I think it's going to be one of the most important aspects of chemistry in the 21st century. And it's that flexibility that interested me about carbon chain molecules. Okay? Now, just remember this. The start of what I'm going to tell you now was my interest in the vibrations of linear carbon molecules. And that led on to a project with my close friend and colleague, David Walton. And David is an expert in creating long carbon chain species. He made a chain of 32 carbon. Now, I was just overall a chain of 32 carbon. It's a linear molecule, and how would it vibrate? Okay? And that we synthesized, and the synthesis was by an undergraduate. And then, about the same time, radio astronomy and infrared astronomy. Here is a part of the sky, those stars that you can see on both sides, but look at this star that's coming up now. That one inside that blue up, it's not there. With infrared telescopes, you can see inside these black clouds. There's a black cloud here. You see it? And inside it is the brightest object on the right hand side, the brightest infrared object. And that led to an experiment in Canada. This is a photograph I took. It was in the middle of summer in Canada, as you can see, of this radio telescope. And here it was. And we started to look for this molecule in space. We'd synthesized it in the lab and we determined its rotational frequency. As a molecule rotates, it sends out a, a photon and you can absorb it by the radio telescope. And what we discovered that in some parts of space, there were large amounts of carbon linear molecules. Okay. Then this star was discovered, and it was, the molecules was discovered in this carbon star. This is a star in which all the atoms, the carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen atoms in your body were synthesized in a star like this. The star is right at the center. You can't actually see the star. It's just bright scattering. This is carbonate dust. You were once inside a star. Your carbon atoms were forged inside the star. The star blew up. Splued your atoms out into space, and you ended up on the Earth today. You're lucky to be here. Most of the carbon is out there. Most of the people who could be here are out there. And there are quite a lot of people on the planet that I think we should send back out there as well. Okay. So I'm going to tell you the first part of this experiment. There's something going on in this star that is creating those molecules. And then I met Rick Smalley. I was visiting Bob Curl at Rice University in Texas. And what Bob had done, what Rick had done, was devise a brilliant piece of apparatus where you would vaporize aluminium and produce clusters, okay? And when I saw this, I thought, well, if we change this to carbon and vaporize graphite, we would simulate the conditions in these sorts of stars. That was a simple idea. It wasn't even a very important idea. I knew it would work. I wasn't running around. It formed in my mind as I was listening to Rick Smalley. And here, the plasma is coming out and going through this hole in this skimmer into a mass spectrometer. And so, the basic thing was to try to produce these molecules. In 1985, I went back to Rice University to work with Bob Curl and Rick Smalley and met these two fantastic young scientists, Jim Heath and Sean O'Brien, and Yu and Yu. These were the three major young people working on this project. And what we discovered is that when we vaporized graphite, we got a massive signal for a species with 60 carbon atoms. I wrote C60 plus question mark on my printout. We didn't know what it was. C60 huge and C70 also. And basically that was the first part of this. Now, this is where the prepared mind comes in. How do you prepare your mind? I don't know. How did I prepare mine, my mind? Well, it was basically, first of all, an understanding of chemistry, that here was graphite, okay? And somehow that's what we started off with. I was looking, I was staying with Bob Curl, and this is floor of his loo, and every day I would sit up and contemplate this floor. But we see nothing like C. We see 6 and 24, but we do not see 60. And we were out at a restaurant. And we're discussing it, sitting at this table, okay? And the clue for me was an edition of Graphis. This is a magazine that I started to take 
when I went to uni first went to university. It was a graphic art magazine. Nothing really obviously to do with science at all. But there was this particular issue in 1967. And there in there was this image of Buckminster Fuller's dome. And this was a clue. And what we see here is all hexagons. Yeah? Looks like graphite. But it had a secret, which I didn't know what that secret was. And that secret was there was one pentagon in it. Okay. I also had a star dome, which I'd made for my children. Margaret had bought this at the design centre in London. And I'd made it many, many years before. And I didn't remember exactly what the structure was. But I remembered one thing, and very important. And that was that it had pentagons. And those pentagons are crucial. You cannot make, close this up without those pentagons. And that night, Rick played around with hexagons and nothing happened. Then he remembered the pentagons and he had buttons to fill his book. We got the book out. And finally, he made this beautiful model. And if we look at it, it has 60 vertices. It was ecstatic. It was wonderful. And it was this molecule. And then we discovered it was a soccer ball. Wow. It had got to be right. It couldn't be wrong. How could it? We'd somehow vaporized graphite and made a load of these. And here is the team. Sean O'Brien, Jim Heath, Bob Curl, and Rick Smalley and myself. There's a lot more to that story. But I've got other things I want to talk to you about. A whole load of fullerene chemistry. I want to talk about society. Because there is a difference between the scientists and almost everybody else in society. Science is not common sense. And some philosophical issues are very important. I'm going to talk about this philosopher, one of the few philosophers that's important. If you understand German, he says, and he talks about Unmündigkeit. What does he mean? It's the question of what is the Enlightenment? And I want you to think about the Enlightenment. I want you to look it up. Because you are only here today in this world because of the Enlightenment. Okay? Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed mental immaturity. This immunity, immaturity is the inability to use one's own understanding without another's guidance. I want you to think about this. I'm not interested in leaders. I as a teacher want you to be able to think for yourself. I don't want you to listen to someone and accept what they say. I want you to question what they say. I want you to ask me questions and say, you have to justify what you tell me. That is what enlightened attitude is. And now I'm going to say what I think about science. There are aspects of science. It's a body of knowledge. What you learn at school. It's the application of that knowledge, technology. And they're quite different things. And then there's the scientific method. How do you discover something that is new? Okay, those are three clearly, obviously different aspects of science. But there's something much more important. Before it became useful, really, that important aspect has, has really, it was understood at the start, but it's been forgotten. But politicians in particular really ask for research and they're only interested in money and the economy and stuff like that. But that's not why science was born, how science was born, or indeed how science really progresses. Before it became useful, it had another name, and it was called natural philosophy. And the most important aspect of natural philosophy is that it is the complete set of philosophical constructs we have devised to determine whether something is true with a significant degree of reliability. I'm going to say that again and listen to it. If you, if you take nothing away from this lecture, take this away. Natural philosophy is the complete set of philosophical constructs we have devised to determine whether something is true. Truth. With a significant degree of reliability. And the ethical purpose of education must involve the teaching of young people how they can decide what they're being told is true. How do you know what your teacher is telling you is true? How do you know what your parent is telling you is true? But much more important, how do you decide what you're telling yourself is true? The most easy person to mislead is you yourself, because you want something. And you will overlook 
those things that indicate what you think is correct or believe is not correct. Thus the teaching of a fundamental process of skeptical evidence-based assessment of all claims without exception is an intellectual integrity issue which all teachers should address. Without evidence, anything goes, think about it. So there we have it. Now my close friend and colleague, aha, got a problem here, uh, Kappa Comforth. I think my, uh, the battery has run out, okay. So I'm going to have to get another one. Let me just think where my bag, is my bag uh, there somewhere? Uh, let me put this in. I should have thought of it about this. All right, wait a second. I hope to be. All right. Oh, unfortunately, I've taken them out, but never mind. We'll be okay. We'll have to work without them. My, uh, my close friend and colleague, Kappa Kornfor, he's been deaf since the age of 18. He's now 92. He's a great scientist. And he said, it may seem odd that a system of knowledge based on doubt could have been the driving force uh, in constructing modern civilization. Okay, let me just plug this in because it, I may be able to get it to work in a minute. Scientists do not believe they check. I'm not asking you to believe anything I can say on a scientific method, only that there is tested evidence for all of it, and I know the nature of that evidence, and I can make a judgment of its worth. All right? That's science. The great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. What a great line. Belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. And who said it? This president. There are three senses. What are they? Whoop, let, me see. Whoop, let me go back here. There are three senses. What are they? Common sense. Now, common sense is interesting because common sense tells me that the sun goes round the earth. Who agrees with me that the sun goes round the earth? <laughs> Nobody. What I said was, common sense tells me that the sun goes round the earth. Where was it this morning? It's common sense, it goes round here. All right. If you want to know what it was like 500 years ago to claim that the earth goes round the sun, that is where you would end up in Europe. That's where Giordano Bruno ended up for claiming such things as the earth goes round the sun. It's uncommon sense that tells us that the earth is turning on its axis. That makes it appear as though the sun is going round us. The uncommon sense and bravery of Copernicus, Galileo and Giordano Bruno. Copernicus published his results after he died. He was frightened of this claim. Galileo was threatened by the Inquisition and Giordano was burnt to death for these claims. You're very lucky to be here. Now I'm going to ask you, how many of you know the evidence that the Earth is turning on its axis? Not many. That's very interesting. Because now you should ask yourself, what else have you uh, uh, decided without knowing the evidence? Okay. 95% of the world believes stuff for which there is no evidence, which is palpably untrue. And nonsense is common now. Walt Whitman, the great American writer, said, no one, I think, has described science better than him. I like the scientific spirit, the holding off, the being sure, but not too sure. The great writer says it 
so beautifully. The willingness to surrender ideas when the evidence is against him, this is ultimately fine. It keeps the way beyond open. He draws attention to the most important aspect of science that makes it different from everything else. The way beyond is open. It moves on inexorably. All other constructs are locked in immutable, nascent dogma for all eternity, never changing, totally impervious to rational criticism. Einstein and Spinoza. Okay, well, let's think about these guys. Cardinal O'Connell attacked Einstein's general theory of relativity and told the Catholic that they cloaked the ghastly apparition of atheism and befogged speculation, producing universal doubt about God and his creation. A New York rabbi asked Einstein with a simple word, five word, one, do you believe in God? He said, I believe in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in the God who concerns himself with the fates and actions of human beings. Okay? So Einstein's God is not interested in you. And Einstein's God is not interested in how you end up in your fate. Let's go and see another scientist. What does he think? You see, one thing is I can live with doubt and uncertainty and not knowing. I think it's much more interesting to live not knowing than to have answers which might be wrong. I have approximate answers and possible beliefs and different degrees of certainty about different things, but I'm not absolutely sure of anything. And there are many things I don't know anything about, such as whether it means anything to ask why we're here and what the question might mean. I might think about it a little bit. If I can't figure it out, then I go to something else. But I don't have to know an answer. I don't, have, I don't feel frightened by not knowing things, by being lost in a mysterious universe without having any purpose, which is what it really is as far as I can tell us. It doesn't frighten me. Now, Hopefully I've got uh, this out, okay. Let's think about science. I, I think that's an important, before I do go on, I wanted to think what he's saying. He's basically saying he doesn't need to know these things. He just doesn't need to, even whether it means anything to ask why we're here. He just says this is the way it is, and that's what I, I as a scientist, and, and he's happy with that. What about science itself? Fantastic contributions. I want you to look at this. There were no mobile phones to see these pictures. This is what it like, was like to have an amputation in the 18th century. There's no greater gift from chemistry than anesthetics. Penicillin. Fleming noticed that the bacteria on this plate we're, we're dying, okay. However, in 1939, when the World War II started, the Ernst Chain and Flory actually started to look at the penicillin. It was not patented, and here is one of the unsung heroes of that story. And this is what it was like to have blood poisoning in 1942. A year earlier, this girl would have died, but she was cured by penicillin in, in three weeks. Okay, this is the miracle, penicillin. You don't have to pray. Okay, it works. And the future is a problem. Bacteria are evolving with an immunity to antibiotics. Think about it. We need young people committed to actually the sciences to try and solve the problems of the future. And there's probably no one in this room who either themselves has not had an antibiotic or in fact someone in their immediate family. In fact, probably a significant fraction of you would not be alive today had it not been for penicillin. Think about that. Misplaced credit. Uh, this gentleman, Alan Cross, has spent 25 years in the Florida jail and he was freed after DNA tests showed that he was an innocent man. When he came out, he said, it's been a long time coming, 24 years in a jail for a crime he did not commit. I thank God for this day. His faith kept him going, but it was science that got him out. 
And here is Sir Alec Jeffries, a friend of mine, who actually developed it. It was a scientist who developed this humanitarian contribution. Lasers. Let's think about this, because of all the things I want to tell you, I think this is interesting for you to think about it. In a laser, what you have, you have a photon which comes in and causes absorption, and you get the blue color of copper sulfate crystal. It's absorption. Light is absorbed, and they go from an energy level to a higher one. Spontaneous emission, basically the photon comes out spontaneously, the molecule goes down to the lower state, and you get emission. And then there's something called simulated emission. Two have come out, okay? Now then, if you take the Boltzmann factor and then fill it up, there are usually more systems and atoms and molecules in lower levels than in upper levels. And Boltzmann was a great, basically, scientist to solve that problem. And in general, when you have a sort of an ensemble of molecules, there are more in the lower state than the upper state. But this gentleman on the left, Charlie Towns, thought, well, let us create a system where all the molecules are, are in the upper state. And then what happens is you get a laser. Two come out, three come out, four come out, and they all come out in the same direction. And that's basically the laser. Now, who could foresee that you get laser rock concerts, barcode readers, and laser eye surgery. Now, I want you to think about this. You can give all the money on the planet to eye surgeons, they'll never invent the laser. That's fundamental science. It's not strategic science. And Charlie Towns wasn't made doing this to invent a laser, uh, uh, do something for eye surgery. He was just fascinated by the process. And when he developed it, then there were, suddenly there were loads of applications of the laser which were never even contemplated at the time. And who are the scientists, the heroes and heroines? Okay. Well, most people think about this guy. Well, from Back to the Future. Oh, this is a typical picture of a scientist. Okay. And people think this is a great scientist. Well, he's not. He's an imposter. This guy didn't do all that stuff. The guy that did it is this guy. Yeah, it's young Einstein. In fact, he was younger than most people in the audience. He was 13 and, and 17 when he started to think about what it was like to travel at the velocity of light. You are now in the most creative time of your life. You may not know quite enough or got enough expertise, but you have to retain that creative potential that you have now because it just dies away. You are the scientists now developing this. All right? Darwin, well, when he went on the voyage, he was young Charlie. And when he created this, and in fact, some people appreciate it. Okay. This is a phylogenetic tree. And that's my bumper sticker, because I designed the bumper sticker. And the T-shirt, all right, which is shown here. Clark Maxwell, when he created these equations, he was not the guy with this beard. He was this fellow. We gently with a little quiff on the top of his head. Okay. Yeah. Rosalind Franklin took the most important photograph of all time. Of all people, she certainly would have won the Nobel Prize had she not died a few years too soon of cancer. This is the most important photograph ever taken. All right. And that led to the structure of DNA. Chandrasekhar was a young man when he realized that the star, one and a half times the size of the sun, the mass of the sun, would collapse into a neutron star. None of these people were thinking about the value of these things. They were just looking at the way it works. The problem is not people like this that are your heroes, but people like this guy. And he's a Scientologist as well. Jimmy, Sean LeBron, and you and you and John Hare were the people who helped us. Very interesting piece of film here. We were trying. All of those are going to be very important in shaping our understanding of the world and how we can manage it. Nope. Sorry. Oh, I'm going to do it again, sorry. It's, there's one slight problem that when it goes on, on here...
the rules of the game that take us from the industrial age to the information age come from basic research. And my favorite example is quantum mechanics. I, I can only imagine if you had to uh, go and justify why you were studying quantum mechanics in the 1920s, that uh, it would be an absolute disaster. Uh, I believe that in the 1920s, quantum mechanics was more mysterious than uh, string theory is today, and there was less of an appreciation. Yet today, uh, I'll just throw a number out there, that 40% of our GDP derives from quantum mechanics. And why do I say that? We live in the information age, so where do we create information? With quantum devices. Where do we store it? With quantum devices. How do we transmit it? With quantum devices. How do we manipulate it with quantum devices? The information age would simply not be possible without quantum mechanics. And so I call that a game changer because it took us from the industrial age to the information age. And what that next game changer is going to be, we don't have the slightest idea. Uh, but we know, based on history, that there will be a game changer and it will come from basic research and you know, 50 years from now, 30 years from now, 100 years from now, uh, people will say, thank goodness they invested in basic research. Education, the last part of what I want to talk about. Well, what do we dream of in education? We dream of kids who really appreciate quantum mechanics. There's the Dirac equation, okay. And there's an error here, and it says there's a minus sign missing there, all right? Maxwell's equation, DNA, Heisenberg and Certainty Principle, LSD, so I'll gloss over that one, and the fullerenes and nanotubes and the Mobius strip. My favorite is this. Now, I want you to listen to this. Nicole says, um, my tattoo is the Taylor expansion of sign. I consider it the most beautiful thing I have ever learned. That's what I want to hear. A student who thinks about this and thinks that mathematics is beautiful and recognizes that the language of mathematics has something within it of tremendous spirit and beauty. That's what it's about. And we actually met her, believe it or not. And here is Nicole at Lindau in 2010. I do workshops around the world, and uh, basically, uh, it, you can. I just go on. A fantastic translator. These were Spanish, Hispanic kids in Mexico, and I was speaking English, but I had a wonderful translator into Spanish. It was a fantastic 350 kids there. Okay, so those are what it's about. And in fact, they they showed creativity. I wanted to show you a bit of this creativity. I just love watching that the film with kids really enjoying science. All right, so basically it's pretty obvious. If we want to save the planet, 
If we want to work, we need to teach our children together. This is one of my favorite photographs of one of our science workshops for small kids. And if we don't do that, we're going to have more and more problems. I think we have to throw away our nationalism and patriotism and our things. We've got to work together because we're on this planet and now it's a global problem. And I do these kid workshops all over the world. For instance, in the States, in Mexico, as you've seen, in Shanghai, Margaret and I here in Shanghai, uh, in Malaysia, in Japan, by internet to Iceland, across the whole of Australia by internet, in the UK. When I show this picture in the UK, the screams by young girls in the audience uh, from in the UK, it's not me, the bald-headed guy over here, it's this guy with blue face. This is Diego Forlan, who got the golden boot in uh, the last World Cup. And here is the one person who's had a, found a use for C60 on molecule. And now here we see a big one. Okay, now, you have a fantastic world. I want to show you what it was like when I was your age. I had to look in here and I had this pile of things and I had to find out what was going on, okay? How many of you have looked in an encyclopedia? Everybody, only people over the age of 300 and something. Okay. What you have is what I call the Guru Wiki world. Okay. What is it? If I try to look in an encyclopedia for C60, I got this, and it's not that imaginative, but I go to Google Image Browser and put any of those in, what I see are pages and 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 pages, and I've even got rotating buckyballs. Okay. That's fantastic. It's a revolution, a triple revolution. A paradigm shift in seeking, finding and accessing information. You can create your own material, which young people like you are doing. And Wikipedia is the most important breakthrough since the printing press for education. And we are now adding to that. Because we're creating nodes where people like you are adding to that cache in the following way. So what, let me so show you what we're doing. We're doing little presentations on various things like maps. And children have no problem with algebra, okay? In fact, I teach algebra to children of five, six, and seven. I take a box, and F is the number of faces, six. How many corners? Eight. How many edges? Twelve. Six plus eight, and I introduce an equation. That's all there is to algebra. You relate an object to a letter, and then six-year-olds can solve that equation. No problem at all. We have students doing presentations on what they're interested in. Okay. Here are the Beatles. George, John, Ringo, and Paul. We all know their music, and most of us even know of their impact on the world today. However, whether we realize it or not, we've had more contact with another type of beetle, and they have had far more influence on our very lives. And I'm talking about these beetles, the insects. And this presentation will be all about the wonderful world of beetles. So why talk about bugs? They seem so ins insignificant and so unimportant. Well, first of all, the stuff... I'm going to jump on, just to give you an idea, because this is... Let's go to... Eyes, also known as lightning bugs, are actually beetles. And they use a process called bioluminescence in order to produce light. Bioluminescence is defined as the chemical reactions that occur within an organism that produce light. And the chemical light show fireflies are actually used in mating. Each species has a different light show that attracts its corresponding mate. And this is the actual chemical reaction that occurs within fireflies using the chemical deluciferin and uh... Okay, that's just one. All right, so let me go to the next one. We've got one on wolves. When we, that was an undergraduate, by the way, and this is a graduate student. Hi, my name is Terry Gilmore, and I'm a graduate student here at Florida State University. I work for Dr. L. Dugan as a organic chemist. Now, I love organic chemistry because it provides the opportunity to go through and be an architect, an engineer, builder, because you can go through and we can really look at designing molecules, we can 
figure out how to actually make these molecules, and then finally, we actually get to go into the lab and actually build these things. Now, the greatest advantage of this by far is nature. Nature can go through and take something as utterly simplistic as these small seeds, and through a series of organic transformations using chemistry that we ourselves use, uh, it's able to go through and transform into these beautifully complex and beautiful flowers that you can see here. I'm going to just jump on a bit, okay? So we should be able to get to about here. And he's going to show you some of his, uh, the reactions. If yeah, we were to go through and keep going. So if we look at this particular reaction, we start with something relatively simple and form something ultimately much more complex. And if we look at that glass structure there, the, the last radical before it actually finishes, it goes through, and it looks like if we were to add more triple bonds in this case, we could go through and fully zip up these structures. We could go through and take something, instead of just something that's relatively small, and close it up. We can extend that all the way through and form much longer chains. So that's a graduate student. Now, <clears throat> we've just got this one from the, from the UK. My PhD research is on organometallic uranium complexes for small molecule activation. So what is small molecule activation? Well, in this context, the small molecules that I've been looking at are I'm going to jump on a bit, okay. two, three, or being as a possible candidate in organometallic context to see if they will make a decent catalyst and see if we can transform and activate these small molecules. So why would we choose uranium? Well, it's an early act, and I write down at the bottom of the periodic table. Here's atomic number 92. And it does get a bit of a bad rap. It's always associated with radioactivity and uh, nuclear weapons. Okay, I'm going to jump out now. We're getting people like you to contribute to this cache of knowledge. Young students and even high school kids in Japan are contributing. Okay? And we're doing this by synchronizing the PowerPoint with the video. Okay? So I don't need to come here. I'm on the web. Okay, you can watch some of this lecture by looking on the internet. You don't have to come here. You can look at it at your leisure. We synchronize the video with the PowerPoint. All right. And it's a future of broadcasting. Okay. And the sites are basically a gateway site, geoset.info, and geoset.fsu.edu are just one of, the, of these sites. And what have we done? We've revolutionized the resume. We put our students on top of the pile, such as Kerry, who you've just seen. Instead of just being a pile of paper, you actually see him by clicking into the URL. And if you're a teacher, assessment becomes a pleasure, because instead of the headache of going through this pile of paper, I can sit at home with a glass of wine watching you on the internet, my students on the internet. And this is the proof that it works, because you want evidence. Kerry got a Fulbright scholarship. Steve, who works with me, put together a beautiful film on what we're doing, and we got a Rich Media Award. Prajna, an Indian student, the first student, got four tenure track offers. That's almost unheard of today. To get one is almost impossible. Brittany got into medical school, and she said the recording, you said recording was the, was the defining factor. Artrice was one of my students. When she went for an interview, she walked in. The person in charge of the interview said, we saw you on the internet and we enjoyed your presentation. Jennifer got into vet school. Dan got the Goldwater Scholarship, the most prestigious award in the USA for undergraduates. Noriyuki and our Japanese node got into NHK. And this is the most important for you here. Sino is an Indian postdoc who was in Toyo in Japan. She applied to the Mahatma Gandhi University and sent the URL of her presentation and without going back to India, she was offered the job. We have revolutionized this. And my colleague, Mark Riley, sent the links to his students to NSF and the feedback was that they really enjoyed it. So if you've got a research proposal, you can put these URLs, and they're 10 times better than a, a written research results overview. 
Okay? Just think about that. You have to write saying, to convince someone who's giving you the money that you've actually done something. What you can do now is you can take some of your best presentations and send them and say, this is what we've produced. It's maybe even a hundred times better than a written report. We have GSF nodes in the USA, three universities and a high school. In the UK, three and two. In Japan, a university, a research institute, manor and a high school. And in Spain and Croatia, and I just last week in Russia, they're going to open one up in Russia as well. And finally, I want to tell you what education is all about. It's not about winning prizes. When you, on your deathbed, will you be bothered about whether you won the Nobel Prize or not? No, it'll be something else, whether you've done something worthwhile. Well, a few weeks ago, we were in Delft in Holland, and I was running with Margaret a buckyball workshop at one of these tables. And little children were coming up to these tables to work on symmetry objects. They were just fascinated by these things. And the first little girl that came up to the table was, this, was not this one, not this little boy, look at him playing with his tongue out, fantastic <laughs> little picture, making this buckyball. And here his sister, and here a little boy, who probably was from somewhere over here, making buckyball. But this little girl, three years old, and Margaret and I were just transfixed. Without help from anybody else, she started to put it together. And Margaret took this fantastic set of pictures. Now watch this. All right? No help. Three years old. And then, look at this. <laughs> That is what creativity is about. Don't do things because you want to win prizes. Don't do things because you want to make money. Do things to the best of your ability that you really want to do. It's not about something necessarily that you enjoy. I don't enjoy hard work anybody, more than anybody else. Do, if you're defined as something that it's three o'clock in the morning and you haven't noticed that it's time for bed, then that's what you should do. That's what you do. I spend hours, okay, doing the, getting these presentations together. I don't think about them for winning prizes. I'm not interested in this. I do them because it's what I do. The problem, if you go into science to win a prize, the probability is you'll be very disappointed. Go into science because you're good at it, it satisfies you, it might be hard work, it gives you some personal satisfaction in, the, in, in your mind, and it's a good way to earn a living. And if you go to a university, you can teach as well, and you'll probably be successful. Thank you very much.